Uh, welcome everybody to the next, next session. Uh, we're going to cover considering cover crops and uh, here it is what you need to know. Um, as the state's nutrient reduction strategy continues to develop, Iowa farmers and ranchers are stepping up to improve the environmental and sustainability of their land. One of the commonly adopted practices is planting cover crops. Various varieties of cover crops have the ability to reduce nitrate leaching and phosphorus by about 30 percent. Not only does this practice provide benefit to soil and water quality, but it also generates a feed source for Iowa cattle producers. This panel of producer, industry, and academic experts will line out key concepts and benefits to growing and feeding cover crops in Iowa. Our panelists today include Tom Miller. Uh, he has been raising cattle for 23 years, and, and in the past five years, he has incorporated cover crops into his operation to use as cattle feed and improve soil health. Tom has used more cover crops such as triticale and rye for stored feed for the winter and has also incorporated cocktail mixes for stockpiled feed. He believes there is an incredible value in cover crops, not only for farmers with livestock, but row crop farmers as well. And uh, please help me in welcoming Tom Miller. Oh, thank you. Um, like he said, I've been doing the cover crops for about five years now, and we started off with um, triticale um, after corn silage, just to help hold the ground and to um, start um, having a crop that we could chop in the spring. And um, we were following it with soybeans. Um, the other reason we were doing the triticale was um, for a place to get rid of manure in the um, sort of an off time of the year other than fall where most practices were. Um, since then we've um, started incorporating a cocktail mix that um, we can take through the summer. Some of them we graze through the summer, others um, we are following. Um, this year we followed oats um, with our cocktail mix so and that's what I'm grazing today. Um, I do have a few pictures here. Um, this is um, what our cover crop cocktail looked like um, coming out of the ground. This is um, actually after our oat crop. We um, applied 5,000 gallons of liquid hog manure after the oats. And this is um, buckwheat, wheat, or rye, um, sunflowers, oats, turnips, um, forage collars, and sunflowers. And then this is um, what that turned into. Um, and I guess we did, in this particular mix, we had some sedan grasses. Um, reason um, we do different mixes, I guess, is just to have a diversification. Um, I think a lot of things complement each other. There was also pearl millet in this particular mix. Um, and I don't have, see a pearl millet in there. But we had pearl millet that um, ended up being about six foot tall. Um, this is, a lot of people don't know what buckwheat is. Um, we put the buckwheat in. It helps with the phosphorus uptake and availability of, um, for the next crop. Um, it's a short term crop. Um, there's another picture of what things looked like as we were coming through um, the growing season. Um, the one thing that um, I've learned through the cover crops, there's some turnips and that was um, first of September. Um, challenges that we've had with the cover crops is getting the timing down to when we can get um, get the, the growth. Following corn and soybeans, you get into a period of time that um, your growing season's real short. When you get into, you know, October, November, those types of year, time of year, your growing season on a lot of these crops to get a forage out of is rather short. Um, 
I, so I save those time periods for my triticale um, so that it can grow all winter long. And I've gone to uh, mixing triticale with rye um, because I, the rye is just a lot hardier plant. It's easier to get established um, and um, it winters a lot better, I think, than sometimes the triticale does. On the feed side of it, um, the triticale rye mix, I think, just makes real good cow feed. Um, um, the other thing we've started doing is instead of going to soybeans after our triticale and rye, is we've, um, we've gone to um, planting a briquetic dwarf sorghum um, after our triticale and rye. Um, for one thing, it's um, very economically seed-wise, it's about $18 an acre. Um, I can put hog manure on after my rye um, and get manure out there and my, after the rye and triticale, um, plant my sorghum, and um, we've been getting, that's about how tall the briquetic dwarf gets. Um, we've been able to get 10 ton of rye and um, triticale off of an acre of um, ground and then come back and get between 18 and 20 tons of sorghum silage. So um, with ground price, land prices the way they are and the nutrients we've got, um, I feel that it really benefits us on um, um, land values and economical feed. Um, um, the sorghum, um, like I said, about $18 an acre in seed cost. We um, use a corn herbicide on it for our weed control, and you've got about um, $22 in that. And the hog manure provides everything that nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that you need for the, the rest of the crop. Um, I've gone to pretty much strictly no-till on what little row crop being that we do now, um, this past few weeks, we've been real wet in southeast Iowa. The fields that um, I've got cattle on right now that have been no-till for at least five years, um, the cattle tracks I've noticed are very minimal. Um, the fields of cover crops that we've um, chisel plowed three years ago, even though it's been no-tilled the last two years, the the damage, I would say, you, the cows have been sinking into about where we chisel plowed three years ago. It's, um, it's made that much difference um, in the soil profile, I would say. Um, our yields have been great. Um, everybody always wonders what the economic effect of it is. Is it worth the price of seed, the extra herbicide cost, um, what um, what benefits you, you get from it. Um, two years ago, I've got a 40 acre field that is divided in half and we've been cover cropping on that particular field. This would have been our fifth year on half of it. The other half has just been conventional corn beans. Um, two years ago, we were in a dry situation and um, the beans on the half of the field that had had cover crops out yielded the other half of the field by seven bushel to the acre. Other than the cover crops, the crop rotation, the um, nutrients, they'd all been treated the same, same variety of soybeans. The only difference really was the soil types we're probably poorer on where we've been doing cover crops because that's why we were doing the cover crops there were to try to hold the ground try to build it up and it is now out yielding the portion of the field that is better soil types and um, it's it's made a big difference um, I think um, the new I, I use less fertilizer now than I have um, and have been real happy with the yields that we're getting. Um, I think we're holding a lot more of our, our nutrients from all the cattle manure. 
and hog manure in, in the soil and making it more available to the, to the livestock. Here's one thing um, I've learned from, from doing the cover crop. I just threw this in. A lot of people say, well, my rye is not growing. Well, rye is sort of a purple color when it comes out of the ground. You usually can't, can't really see it. This is a particular field of cover crop that I'd grazed once, and this is just regrowth um, after the cattle had been, been off of it. So you can, in some of these cocktails, um, get a lot more days of uh, feed off of it than just a one time and um, pull off and would have been that field right there of the cows. Um, that particular field would have had um, sedan grass, um, sorghum, um, rye, um, purple top turnips, buckwheat, sunflowers, um, soybeans. I, I throw soybeans in a lot of my mixes. I've tried the peas and I just don't have much luck with peas growing and usually have leftover soybeans that are treated or whatever and I just throw them in the mix to get rid of them. Um, uh, let's see what else would have been in that one. Um, I think that was about it. There was pearl millet and Japanese millet in that. Um, and I I'm more of a mature grazer. I don't, I, I probably could get more days of feed if I would graze them when they're a little smaller to get more regrowth. Um, but I'm, I like it more mature. They, when it's more mature, I get a little more cover on the ground. Um, they don't need it down as bad. There's just a little more there after I get through it. On my um, um, cover crop fields, I'll strip graze it, but I, I, the way my fields are set up for that, um, they got a back feed to get to a water source. So they do, do get to go over the same amount of ground more than I'd like, but it's just the way my system is. On my permanent pastures, we rotational graze. Um, but I like, well, this would have been September when I got into this piece, particular piece, um, what I started um, doing some of the cocktail mixes was for that end of July, August time period to let my cool season grasses, you know, when they're not um, performing very well for me, it gave me a chance to get into to something with a better feed value and um, get away from the fescue and stuff like that. I, I really like sorghum. Um, it's cheap. You get a lot of tonnage. The cattle do real well on it. Um, I like the rise for into the winter. Um, one thing I did this year that I, each year is different. We all know that. Moisture is different. Heat's different. The timing of the moisture is always different. Um, this year I planted a cocktail mix in May. And I went ahead and put rye grass and annual rye or a a biannual ryegrass in it. Um, I put um, a bushel of rye in with it, um, the sorghum and everything. But I put those winter type feeds into it early to see if I could get it to live through the summer and come back. This particular summer we had good moisture. Looks really good right now. There's probably 10, 12 inches of growth there that I can come back into later here this winter or spring, you know, to graze off. Some years I don't think that'll work. You just run out of moisture, the timing is bad when you're on it, um, but this year it um, worked good. I'm one of that has the opinion that I like a little bit of a lot of things in the mix, maybe have a base, but um, just because some people say, well, that won't work, Sometimes you put it out there and it really worked really well. Uh, you know, different um, plants, I think, it, I, don't, I don't believe in competition. I think a lot of plants complement each other. Um, it's just like the pearl millet that we had this year. You know, we had pearl millet that stood huge. I think it just was a combination of uh, the fact that the other plants just sort of helped complement it and it let it do, do more than what it should have. 
there, there's some things, you know, like putting row crops back into some of these mixes, there are some, some challenges, I would say, to them that you got to get around with either planter attachments, techniques of how you handle the cover crop to terminate it, um, the timing of the termination, and, and things such as that. Um, but uh, my big thing is I, I, I think the cover crops help conserve a lot of nutrients in the soil. It helps build the soil profile. It helps, um, we've had a couple NRCS days come out um, that, and they've done water infiltration tests. They've done um, things um, with um, soil compaction and things like that. And even after just a couple years of cover crops, when you compare them to fields, a field divide. Um, it's just amazing to me how much more water will go into the ground where these cover crops have been just for two years versus where we've never had them before. Um, uh, you, I think the cover crops, you can change your soil very quickly in a short period of time if you're willing to, to, to be, you know, manage what, what you have. And those of us that have livestock and cattle, I think that puts us in a different category than those that are just row crop farmers um, because it lets us utilize, I, th I feel, a very economical feed source that um, accel accelerates our, what we're wanting to do with our ground um, and makes it a win-win for, for a cattle producer. Let's thank Tom for his presentation. I will move on to the next speaker, uh, Mary Dronowski. Uh, Dr. Mary Dronowski is, is a beef system specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She is a beef, cabin, beef cattle nutritionist with expertise in feeding programs, incorporating crop residues and double crop forages for stocker cattle and beef cows. She is part of an interdisciplinary team evaluating economical systems for integrated crop and livestock production. The research and outreach of this team is facilitated by a multidisciplinary approach in which the animal and forage management and the effects on the cash cropping system and the soil properties are evaluated to allow for a full system analysis. That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> Much of the research is currently focused on evaluating agronomic potential of double crop forage species and quantifying performance of growing calves grazing various double cropped forages. Uh, please help me in welcoming Dr. Mary Dunoski. Well, I appreciate uh, the nice introduction and uh, that makes me sound like more of an expert than I probably am. Uh, today I'm really going to talk about uh, some of the opportunities and considerations for uh, adding cover crops into our cropping system, so looking at uh, utilizing them in corn and soybean uh, systems. And the first thing that uh, I wanted to mention is herbicides. I think this is probably the first thing you need to consider if you're thinking about using cover crops for forage. Uh, the crop rotation interval on those herbicides really uh, dictate whether or not you can graze or harvest those cover crops. Uh, there's kind of three reasons why that's true. Uh, the first one's the one everybody thinks of, and that is that uh, herbicide residual left over after uh, your cash crop can impact uh, your cover crop and thus your forage growth. But there's two others that you can't uh, readily determine. Uh, you can't see them. Uh, one is that uh, you can get a residual herbicide that builds up in that cover crop plant and when your cattle consume it, it can be toxic. Uh, sometimes that can occur. The other one is that you can also have that residual that's consumed by the animal and uh, it actually accumulate in uh, some tissue of that animal, typically fat. Um, and so you really do, as a part of your uh, beef quality assurance, uh, you really need to think about making sure you're reading and following the labels. And so I'm going to put a plug in for the Iowa Beef Center. I know I'm from UNL, but they have a nice little um, handout that they've just uh, published, and it's av available at their booth. 
on uh, herbicides and which herbicides you might be able to use in your uh, corn and bean systems to be able to then utilize cover crops following that for forage. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, I'd encourage you all to go take a look. Uh, so now I'd like to talk about, there's really two opportunities here. One is for fall forage and the other is for spring forage if you're trying to incorporate them into your grow crop systems. For fall forage, uh, you're going to be using cool season annuals and they're very, very high quality. And so they're a great option for backgrounding calves, uh, particularly for those of you who wean in October and maybe instead of selling at uh, the typical seasonal low, you can keep them around for another 60 or 80 days and then sell them. Uh, and so there's kind of two uh, systems where that might work. Uh, your corn silage fields and then seed corn fields are great opportunities. <coughs> so what are you going to plant? Well, the first thing is that if you're going to plant something and you want fall forage, you need to plant winter sensitive species because they're going to have the highest uh, biomass production. That means looking at oats or spring varieties of uh, your cereal, so a spring wheat, a spring triticale. Uh, those are going to produce the most mass and thus give you the most grazing. Uh, and then brassicas, you know, turnips, uh, radishes, collards. Uh, those are also uh, winter sensitive. They're going to die out in the winter, but they do produce uh, a lot of biomass relatively quickly. I really like brassicas. They're high quality, but they do have one drawback, and that is that herbicide uh, issue that, that I just discussed. Uh, brassicas uh, tend to be very sensitive to herbicide residuals, and then brassicas also tend not to have um, specifics uh, on the label, and so they fall under what is called the other crop, which means that typically it's the longest possible restriction interval, uh, which eliminates oftentimes using brassicas in our uh, double cropping uh, systems. If you're thinking about uh, this fall forage and you can use a brassica with your herbicide regime, uh, it's a great option, and we typically say that you're really going to want to plant uh, about 60 pounds of oat or some small uh, cereal grain with about four pounds of, of a turnip or a radish. Uh, the turnips are high quality, and they're actually a little bit too high quality. If you don't have a grass in there, we actually don't have enough fiber in the diet, and we actually see performance uh, decrease with uh, really high rates of brassicas in the mix. Uh, so I mentioned corn silage fields are a great opportunity, but I will point out that um, timing matters. And so if you're thinking about using your corn silage fields, uh, you really need to consider uh, maybe your early, earliest harvested corn silage fields or even planting a, uh, a hybrid of corn that's going to be a little bit earlier maturing. You're probably targeting uh, for your... For southern Iowa, you can probably get away with the, with the first week in September as the latest planting date for fall forage. Northern, you're probably two weeks behind, or behind that, so you really need to be somewhere around uh, August 15th if you're trying to get uh, a ton to a ton and a half of grazable forage. Seed corn fields are another great opportunity, and, and I particularly put a plug in here because if you're talking about uh, nitrates, uh, and, and nitrogen leaching, uh, you see corn fields tend to be over fertilized, which is a great opportunity in terms of cover crops because you have plenty of nitrogen for forage growth. Um, this is a couple pictures that I took of uh, some brassicas that were planted into the seed corn fields. And then uh, the last one, uh, that picture that we have here is of actually some oats that was interseeded as well as some brassicas into seed corn when the mail row was destroyed. Uh, and that picture, we got about uh, a ton and a half of forage production at the 1st of October. My guess is that uh, probably by the time we started grazing in November, we were more like two tons. Uh, so two things there. One was I actually didn't expect that oats would do very well broadcast seeded. We didn't do any type of incorporation. Uh, but they did really well in this system. And, uh, and the other one is that we got a lot of forage production for fairly low cost. Uh, when, that, when we're going through Melrose dest destruction, uh, we had a broadcast seeder. The, the cost basically was the seed. Uh, we didn't have to have another pass, and we didn't add any fertilizer. 
so I made the point about planting date, and planting date's extremely important. And so uh, I just have this picture on here to give you an idea. This is two weeks difference in planting date. If you look at the plants that would be on your left, they were planted September 8th, and the plants um, on your right uh, were August 25th. That's, so that's two weeks difference in growth. Um, and the point here is that the day that the combine leaves the field or the chopper leaves the field, that's the day you need to be planting. Uh, delaying will cost you in terms of forage production. And so this is, the, this is the point I like to make that I know everybody's busy when you're harvesting, right? Nobody has time to do this, but it's uh, probably worth it just to hire somebody to come in and go ahead and plant for you uh, because the extra forage production will make it worthwhile. Uh, I get another question quite often, that's when to start grazing. This is more my world because I'm a ruminant nutritionist. And I got two pictures up here. One is uh, taken on November 6th and the other one's on December 9th. And you see we've got green forage and then we've got brown desiccated forage. Um, how many of you would say we lost most of our feed value? Okay, I get a couple people who, who are brave enough to, to raise their hands, and, and that's kind of what I thought, too. I thought, okay, we're going to lose quite a bit of feed quality based off of the way things look. So I have a, a huge table up here, but we'll walk through it a little bit. This is um, radish top, turnip top, and oats, uh, the nutrient content of those uh, taken on those two dates. And what we see is that the radish top, uh, crude protein wise, we were very high protein, right, 28, 27 percent, and we didn't lose any crude protein, uh, even though it went from green to basically brown. The turnip was the very same story, and our oats were also the same story. We didn't lose much protein. Now, when we look at energy, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, those radish tops, very, very high energy. I mean, 80% uh, TDN is extremely high quality, and we did lose five percentage units, uh, but quite frankly, at 77% TDN, um, that's better than any forage, actually, uh, by definition, it wouldn't be considered a forage. Um, and so I actually talk to people a lot about considering brassicas as a kind of like feeding a concentrate or feeding corn. Uh, because it is so high energy. Turnip did the same thing. We lost five percentage units, but still very high quality. Our oats, we do lose a little bit more. Ten percentage units, we're down to 65% TDN, but still very, very good quality. Um, and, and this is the, the reason why I say it's great for backgrounding calves, or if you have uh, lactating cows, say you have fall calving cows, this is a, a great opportunity uh, to, to be able to feed them. Now, I, I put a couple other numbers on here, mainly to make two points. One is that if we look at the fiber content of those brassicas, we're at 20%. We do gain a little bit uh, by weighting, and that's because we lose cell solubles or sugars, which is highly digestible. Uh, but the reason why I point out this fiber content is that we actually don't have enough fiber uh, for proper rumen function if they're only grazing brassicas. That's why we tell you to put in the oats or the spring cereals. Uh, so you can see that the oats had about double the amount of fiber as the brassicas does. And that's the top of them. That's not including just the bulb. And the other point I wanted to make is about the sulfur content. Uh, many of you are familiar that we can have sulfur toxicity, especially in feedlot cattle. Well, uh, we're at 0.7 to 0.8 percent sulfur on these brassicas. Uh, remember, the maximum tolerable level is 0.4 in a high forage diet. Uh, so we do need to dilute that out some, uh, or we risk sulfur toxicity. And so that's another reason to add those grasses in the mix. Uh, so uh, think about having somewhere around 60 to 70 percent grass is kind of where you're trying to target relative to the amount of brassica. And you'll see a, a, a boost in performance as well. There's some data out of Minnesota that when they compared 70% brassica, 30% grass to 70% grass, 30% brassica, they went from one and a half pound a day of gain to two pound a day of gain. So having some, uh, having some grass in the mix is important. Now everybody asked about the economics, and of course uh, with the recent changes in, in prices, uh, that's a, a, 
a moving target. But there are a couple key things. One thing to think about is that depending on what you seed, your seed costs are going to vary. Um, if you plant only brassica, say a purple top turnip, you're going to be about $9 an acre. That sounds great, and that's why everybody wants to do it. Uh, but the problems are that we don't, we're actually not good in terms of our diet. Up to about $42 for some of these uh, high mixes. Um, and we got to charge something for seeding, whether you do it or somebody else does it, it's probably going to cost you 10 to $12. I have nitrogen on here as a consideration. If you're not in a system where you have manure that you're going to apply or you're already over applying nitrogen for your cash crop, you probably should be putting on some nitrogen if you're trying to utilize it for forage. Uh, 30 to 50 pounds are going to uh, significantly increase your yields in systems where uh, there's not a lot of nitrogen. And so that's going to cost you 8 to $23 an acre plus uh, an application cost. So we're looking at somewhere between $40 and $90 an acre uh, for these cover crops. Now what's the value of it? Well, if you're, if you're looking at a calf um, in our seed corn and in our corn silage fields, we usually can get about one ton of what I would say the animals consume. We're, we're somewhere around a ton and a half to two ton of forage production. And we've been getting usually about one calf an acre. We can graze for about 50 to 60 days. Uh, so in terms of gains, they're usually uh, a pound and a half to 2.2 pounds. We actually, it's interesting, I saw the data from Minnesota and said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. We had one system where we ended up having something that was almost 80% brassica and the calves gained a pound and a half and another one where we had 60% oats and they gained 2.2 pounds and you go, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, in terms of what are we going to get then in terms of uh, value out of it, uh, last year's prices were great um, and we were getting somewhere around $200 uh, an acre worth of calf gain. Prices now are a little bit moderated, but I will point out that if you're thinking about using it for your cow-calf guy, you're thinking about using it for the 60 days from October until uh, somewhere in December, the value of gain actually typically increases because you're usually going through that seasonal low. And so that's the, the opportunity in my mind for really capitalizing on using fall forage. Okay, what about spring grazing? And really that's uh, a great opportunity for our, our uh, spring calving cows, having lactating cows out on uh, high quality forage in the spring. And uh, it was already kind of mentioned using rye and triticale. Uh, those are two great options. I will say that cereal rye tends to mature earlier. And so if you're trying to fit it into a cropping system, that's one of its advantages. You'll, you'll get more yield earlier than with triticale or wheat. Um, in this system, fall planting is still advised because fall planting is going to increase your spring yields over a spring planting of, say, a spring uh, variety such as an oat or a spring variety of triticale. I will point out that you can mix the two. You can have a mixture of a winter hardy and a winter sensitive species to try to get some fall grazing and some spring grazing. Uh, we've been playing around with that quite a bit, um, and there's going to be a balance to make sure you don't have too much competition one way or the other to optimize that system. I, I would say that the place where I really like uh, the idea of using uh, cover crops for spring grazing is after your soybean fields, uh, because you can get them planted early enough to get reasonable yields in the spring, you need that cover already because you really don't have enough residue and uh, we can get it drilled. Now what about the effects on of the spring uh, fall planting date on spring yields? Um, this is actually some data out of Iowa and uh, what I did is I took the growing degree days that they uh, were predicting and looked at it based off of several locations in Iowa. So we have basically Northern Iowa versus Southern Iowa, you can see there's some differences. But the key thing to point out here is that there's kind of a date where you'll start losing yield. And for uh, Northern Iowa, that's really in the middle of September. Planting after that date, you start seeing your spring yields decrease. 
now um, for southern Iowa, you guys get another two weeks. Uh, so it's really the end of September. Does that mean if I plant later, it's not worth it? Well, the answer is no. Uh, this only went out to October, about October, the first of October for uh, northern Iowa and uh, the middle of October for uh, southern Iowa. But you can see they were still getting 80% of the spring yields. Uh, so you only lost 20% by that delay uh, of a month. So what I would say is that earlier is better, but you can still get it in after soybeans and get fairly good yields. Uh, the other question I get all the time is about uh, alternate seeding methods, trying to get cover crops into conventional corn. And the only comment I'll make is that we don't have enough information on how to consistently get good yields, how to consistently get good establishment and good yields. Um, some years and in some fields I've seen where flying it on it worked wonderfully and then I can go down the road and there'll be another field and it just was uh, a travesty to waste the money. Um, and so I, I would just say at the moment that uh, it's a pretty risky business. So the last two things I wanted to say is just give you a plug if you're, if you're looking for more information on cover crops uh, for forage production, uh, our beefunl.edu website. Uh, there's a page called uh, Beef Forage Crop Systems. That's where all of our information relating to cover crops for forage is, uh, is put. And I would encourage you to just go take a look. And the last thing is that at the back of the room, there's actually a NEB guide that we just put out really on using cool season uh, forages for uh, late fall and early spring uh, double crop. And the idea of double crop really is cash crop plus a forage crop. And so uh, you can go pick that up if you're interested. Hey, thanks, Mary, for that presentation. Um, next up is Carl Dollarfeld. He is a forage specialist and co-founder of Prairie Creek Seed, headquartered in Iowa. He also owns Dollafeld Cattle Company, a registered Hereford cattle operation, where he uses perennial and annual forages for his forage-based cattle operation. His expertise includes forage species, soil health, quality forages, and grazing management. Uh, let's welcome Carl Dollafeld. Prairie Creek Seed is a forage-based company, and I've been working with forages for 30 years and uh, in our own operation as well. And trying to, uh, we're trying to look at ways to help on the cover, cover crops and, and helping the producers. But first, I wanted to start out with my favorite technical agronomic term. And Tom and Mary should have actually used this. Maybe, it depends. <laughs> but it depends. There are so many variables in, in what we're talking about, and there's not one size fits all type of, of scenario. So a little bit of my presentation is going to be about um, ideas on how to get it incorporated and also looking at some of the different species uh, because it depends. Uh, cover crops, everybody knows the value of that. We've, we've been hearing about it for how many how many years and intensively the last two or three. We look at our erosion control, nutrient capture and release, uh, water com quality, uh, compaction reduction, management of weeds, and not a lot of times is it mentioned feed for livestock. And as cattle producers, I think that's something that we really should look at, not only for the, you know, the long-term benefits, but also the profitability of, of the operations. With, with uh, cover crops uh, for cattle producer, lowering feed costs, that soil biology stimulation with having livestock out there actually helps on the next crop yield. There's nothing like having some livestock manure out on those fields if it's going into a, a grain production the next year. Uh, and also you get some free manure distribution, they're out doing it themselves. And I think it's something that uh, when you start looking at incorporating cover crops into a livestock operation, be thinking outside of the box and looking for ways and investigating and trying different things that'll help um, work for your operation in the long run. Cover crops as a forage, they're 
three things that that I look at uh, is you know getting across to a lot of the country uh, looking at what farmers are doing and what's working and what's not when we look at using a cover crop if we're looking at it as a forage just like Mary had talked about adding additional nitrogen unless we're over nitrifying we really do need adequate uh, fertility out there for the cover crops if we're going to get the most out of it we wouldn't need to do that if all we're trying to do is sequester the excess nutrients and hold them for next year but if we're trying to increase and improve feed quality we're going to have to look at our fertility program and then seeding rates you'll hear seeding rates all over the board and a lot of times if you're looking at if you're looking at a cover crop seeding rate it's going to be lower than what we would want for a forage um, rate and then we've all talked about it the earlier that we can get the establishment the more forage we're going to produce and then we're in Iowa how many fences here have, have gone up lately how many have gone down I can't do it because I don't have fencing or I don't have I don't have water. Uh, really put a pencil to it. Perimeter fences are on a per acre basis, and I'm sure there are fundings to help on that sometimes. I'm looking at Mary, I don't know why. <laughs> but equip funds and things like that, that uh, on a per acre basis is pretty cheap. It's a small chunk of land that's pretty expensive on a per acre basis. And that's where coming in with cross fencing or temporary fences and then I look at also uh, when you're looking at at that fencing that can be put in that equation a little bit of, of hay prices having to bring feed to the livestock rather than having them out going out to it water is always tricky because if there's not a well on the property it's unimproved property uh, worst case scenario haul water you know it's a it's a possibility and then one of the other things I I like to talk about a little bit and it's kind of a sensitive subject but it's less sensitive with the corn prices coming down and that is looking at uh, our rotation because generally if you look at it harvesting corn late October and then coming in and putting in a uh, fall cereal crop such as rye it's too late uh, I like to encourage people to think about it put a pencil to it incorporating at least a few acres of a small grain if you need bedding help on the rotation poor ground what's the what's the anticipated yield on the corn versus what you can do with a small grain and a forage cover crop so you know looking at it step back take a look at the whole picture the whole farm not look at what revenue we're going to create off that acre just with a small grain but look at it over a two-year period what it does for a rotation and look at all the return on investments you know together and I won't say the third one again uh, other things that we look at I always get to go out and look at the best situations but also who gets the calls when there's an issue when I looked at these two two plants sets of plants sitting in the in the pickup there the top one and the bottom one I always ask the audience and I don't think we have time for it today but you know what's the difference between those two and I tell people actually there isn't those are both turnips out of the same lot number one was flown on one was drilled in so our best probability for success is to be able to drill or incorporate somehow these uh, cover crop seeds the one on top was flown on and when you think about a seed that's been flowing onto the top of the ground unless you've got irrigation to help keep it moist and and help incorporate a little bit it's going to take a while for that tap root to get down get it anchored and then start the development so it's going to slow it down and the bottom one was in the local area that was drilled so we had the proper seeding depth and we were able to form that that plant properly so it's always best if we can somehow incorporate it at least lightly and that's just a picture of the the field where they were drilled and then that's the same same species you know same lot number same turnip that was flown on the producer was happy later 
but it took a lot longer for it to develop and, and get him the, the biomass that he wanted. So establishing cover crops, there are a lot of ways to, to do it. Um, my least favorite, I'll start at the bottom, would be the aerial application. It seems like the probability for success is spotty, but sometimes if the weather conditions are right and the pilot's in the area at the proper time, timing's everything with cover crops, uh, we can have pretty good success. But I see a better success where we're doing things like vertical tillage or, or gandy under a, that's actually a gandy mounted on a combine. This out, that's out in Pennsylvania with tubes that go underneath the snoots and, and uh, kind of covers it a little bit and getting it going. And then getting onto the better side, precision planning. We have a fair amount of producers, especially in Minnesota, that are planning it with their corn planters. If you want to reduce your seeding rates, then you can singulate the, you know, get it singulated out to where we're on a four inch spacing. We can accomplish a lot with less seed and we get better depth, depth control. The ones that I'm most excited about for being able to get cover crops are the high clearance machines. This is Hagee Manufacturing. Um, they put together a prototype and are uh, able to get into the corn and do, they're doing some damage, but minimal damage. But at least the seed's getting on the ground and we can reduce the seeding rate and we can get in a little bit sooner and we can get into the field when the crop is ready, not when the pilot's ready. One thing that we've been looking at is Penn State has been doing interseeding into corn at the V3 to V7 stage for about 10 years and have had pretty good success with it. But what everybody tells me is we're not in Pennsylvania, we're in Iowa, we're in, in Minnesota. Um, when we can interseed early, we have more time to establish it. We are gonna limit it a little bit on our species selection and then we could really got to watch the herbicides at that point and check with your insurance agent, but we're feeding cattle. Your, your uh, crop insurance might be out of compliance. They are working on it in certain areas. This is actually up in Minnesota. That's a dark picture on the left, but Dawn Manufacturing had put together a prototype that would fit on a, a toolbar and it come in with two rows that you could put in between the corn rows. That's it over on the right a little later. We're getting the growth. What we're able to do is we're able to get that, that cover crop established, get enough root reserves that it can kind of hold under the canopy. Again, hybrid selection is going to make a little bit of difference. We're rating corns on, you know, what kind of type of canopy to make sure we get adequate sunlight in. But we've been doing this for two years in Iowa and in Minnesota. This happens to be pictures from up in Minnesota. And this is this fall up in Minnesota. You can already see it's pre-harvest or harvest and our cover crop has got some nice growth to it. And what we've seen so far is no yield loss. That's one of the biggest concerns is, is that we'll have yield loss from the cover crop, taking nutrients away from the, the uh, cash crop. It won't interfere with harvest, especially on corn. And we're also, we can keep our costs down Remember the precision planning where we can take our seeding rates. I'll use radish as an example. If we're flying them on, we're going to be at what? 12 pounds, 8 to, eight to 12. I'm a producer myself, so I don't like being on that high side. But if we can precision plant, we can get it down to 3 to 4 pounds per acre. What does that do to your seed costs? So... Again, that's, this is one thing we're pretty excited about. We've got two years under our belt, two different growing conditions, and it's been successful. The reason I put all that out there is just what we were saying earlier. Uh, and I'm not necessarily recommending the shorter season genetics across the board, but a small percentage of your acres where you want to cover crop come in with an earlier grain hybrid. I put this slide up here really because of that phrase up there, one day in September is worth four or five days in October. And I would say in northern Iowa, one day in August is worth four or five in September. You know, we're running out of daylight and we're running out of heat. So that, we really need to look at, at uh, 
our timing and getting things done sooner. These were these are fall pictures. These were planted in June and July. This is some of the interseeding after after corn harvest. And on the right is something that was planted in early July, and it would come into those warm season annuals behind a small grain. And you can see how much more tonnage we have doing that. But if you compare that to the picture here on the left where this was rye planted in behind corn silage late, uh, we're gonna pick, that's where we're gonna pick up our tonnage and get the you know, acre days out of some of these cover crops. When it comes to forage species, I like, I like blends. I like if you wanna do a cocktail mix, but really getting started and depending on what you're going to be you know, doing, if you're interseeding, we're not gonna use a cocktail mix. We're gonna use clovers and annual rye and, and uh, uh, brassica. Um, the clovers here, that's a list of some of the ones that I think work well in cover crop. On our grass side for either a fall or midsummer seeding, these are some of the forage species. We've got cereal rye, triticale, oats, annual rye grass or Italian rye grass. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish again, but cereal rye is almost infallible. And it works and we can plant it late um, and it'll make really, really good forage. But if you want something that's gonna be terminated in the spring, you just want fall grazing, then we can look at a cereal crop such as oats. Where I struggle is on annual rye grass and Italian rye grass because it may or may not winter kill. <laughs> it needs to be planted earlier, but I can't give a producer a guarantee that it's either gonna kill out or if it's gonna make it through the winter. But they're very, very high quality forages. That's just some uh, several years ago when I was uh, background in cattle, some cereal rye late. Here's why we look at the clovers that we look at. If you can look at these pots here, all planted at the same time, you can see the, the annual clovers and specific ones, the crimson, persian, and bursim are all faster to establish. We're trying to get something that'll get up, get going, start producing nitrogen earlier and uh, give us our tonnage and work under our canopy and uh, a cover crop. The brassica families, radishes, turnips, forage rates, the, the hybrid brassicas, they each have, in my opinion, you gotta look at the timing of when you're gonna be putting in your cover crop in your selection, and then also uh, what you're trying to accomplish. I always like a radish in there because they do such a nice job of, of compaction reduction and sequester nutrients. And for the quality side, I like the turnips or the forage rate. Um, hybrid brassicas, I, I really like them. They're shorter growing period versus rape seed, which would take 60 to 90 days versus 30 to 40. So um, I think hybrid brassicas will work well in our part of the country. And then if we're doing something behind oats or a small grain winter wheat, um, behind rye, look at your sorghum sedan, sedans, millets, and then on the legume side, cowpea, sun hemp, bursim. And then we have a little more, if we can plant it in midsummer, we have more flexibility on how many species and what we can use. And the benefits of the mix, of having mixes or cover crop blends or that uh, diversity of soil micro <laughs> microbiology and our carbon and nitrogen ratio and better forage quality. We're gonna be offsetting each other. Um, before we get on to questions, uh, on the tables there are some surveys. Uh, the survey for this here session is towards the back of it, so if you could fill that out and put it in a green box in the back, that'd be wonderful. And then the front part of the survey is kind of an overall survey, so fill out what's necessary there and put it in a green box, we'd sure appreciate it. Um, otherwise, let's uh, open it up for questions, uh, and if we could, we'll repeat the question. and. And answer it. The question why it was is why don't we like aerial applications and uh, why they work? and why don't they work? From my perspective, a lot of times I look I look at 
the aerial applicators are coming out and they've got their routes and again we always go back to that timing's critical if you plant a cover crop too soon when there's no sunlight getting down to the the soil or we're too dry you're not you're not going to germinate or if you do germinate you run out of sunlight and energy and you don't get the stand if if i was going to and i'm not saying we shouldn't aerial apply but i would certainly want the producer to have a little more control and do a, the, when the timing's right and making sure we have adequate moisture. Otherwise, you're just throwing rice seed out there for the fun of it. So I, I would agree with many of his sentiments in that uh, timing is everything. And so it has a lot to do with getting the, the light to the plants when you need to having the amount of moisture seems to be hugely important and so we've had more success in irrigated systems where we can apply moisture if we need to uh, but then uh, the other part of the scenario that we haven't really discussed is is that residue management and even if we get something up and established uh, if we come through and we cover it up in irrigated systems or in your systems where you have very high yielding say 200 bushel or above um, we actually see where we stunt the growth because uh, when we go through and harvest, we actually cover over a lot of our plants and they actually get starved for light. So it, it doesn't matter whether that's aerial seeding or broadcast seeding or even, as he was talking about, some of these systems where you might be able to drill uh, precision planting. Uh, I think that there's a lot of th factors that we have to balance and we haven't quite figured out what all of those are yet and how to make the perfect situation. And so, like I said, some years I've seen some really good stands and good yields, and in others I, I've seen uh, complete failures. Uh, I do see that it seems like it's been working a lot better for us in fields that are lower yielding fields, and I think that has a lot to do with how much light gets down there. Um, and so I just, I don't feel comfortable recommending to producers to do this uh, and spend the money until we can have a fairly high idea that where they're going to succeed. Anybody's got a uh, uh, detasseling machine or any other high clearance machine, they can make their own uh, way to get it out there. And there you're not holding it up in the canopy. You're going to get it down underneath. You, you lose a lot of seed up in, in the canopy yeah. on, on the aerial. And you're in, you're in more control. I, of, I would also point out that corn silage systems, I mean, I was talking about conventional corn, but it, it, corn silage systems, you have the you have the call on when you when you harvest, and so you can you can actually dictate you know that it doesn't matter that it didn't get dry enough per se, um, and so you're limiting a lot of risks there, and you don't have the residue problem. Uh, so aerial seeding into corn silage might be a completely different story than in conventional corn. Um, I I think that there's again there's still risk any time that you're trying to put it into a stand, but you have a lot more say in controlling some of the variables. And the daylight, you're going to get daylight down there a lot faster than if you're going to harvest it for grain by far. Because a lot of times I've noticed you'll get it started and you'll get two, three inches of growth and then you go out two weeks later and you just got dead plants. I. I I think we should address the initial question about um, having rye and reducing uh, corn yield. Can you can you not hear me? I'm sorry. Um, and and I would say there's a couple things. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about the allelopathic effect of rye in particular and it reducing corn yield and so everybody discusses the fact that you need to kill your rye out you know 10 days before you plant uh, or even earlier we've seen some uh, effects even of winter sensitive species planting brassicas and oats and having subsequent effect on our uh, corn yields uh, we planted some brassicas and oats after wheat uh, we got a lot of really good yields because we put on a bunch of manure that was feedlot manure um, and then we looked at grazing that versus not grazing that versus not planting and our best yields in the corn was where we didn't plant anything but the point I want to make here is that we got we got an improvement in yield over the cover crop 
system if we grazed it and the reason why I think that is it's all about nitrogen and how, how much available nitrogen there is and there's actually thought now that most of the rye decrease is actually due to it tying up some nitrogen that otherwise would have been available and so there's a lot of discussion about actually using more starter fertilizer to get uh, that corn up and going and and then r realizing that some of the nitrogen that would have been available is now not because it's tied up in plant tissues it's going to become available but it's a slower start and so um, I would just make that point that I think uh, I think there's still things we're learning about how to make the system work to the optimum but I think we need to recognize that it's not going to be exactly the same and it may be you shift how when you fertilize such that you put on a little bit more at the start to get things uh, up and going and not be starving those plants. I, by the way, I'm not a cropping system specialist, so this is a ruminant nutritionist's opinion, um, but those are some of the things I've heard from the cropping systems people. I agree fully. Soybeans do really well after rye because their their nitrogen needs are met, you know, through the through the plant. Um, I agree with what Mary said. You're going to have to increase your nitrogen if you're coming in behind right. What's that? Definitely yeah, so correct. Nice. Correct. That, I, that's why I see I see it more of a nutrient tie up, early tie up with the rye over an allopathic effect. I was on a, at a program just a few weeks ago, and the row croppers were talking about the rye um, on high fertility ground where they're applying lots of manure. Um, they all agreed 100% that if you're following rye with corn, um, they're all were on board that you need at least 60 pounds of liquid in with the planter dribbled on bes beside it, um, or otherwise they seen yield uh, yield problems. The nitrogen and in their tissue tests and everything later were fine. It's just that the nitrogen's tied up in that rye longer. So your plant doesn't get taken off near as fast. Was there? Um, the, the, what they were talking about doing is they um, they were all talking, and I'm not a row cropper for say, but they were all using a totally tubular system, where it dribbles the liquid nitrogen right behind the planter unit, right on top of the ground. They said that they done studies on their planters, divided it into fours, divided them in half with different systems, and they said just dribbling 60 pounds of nitrogen right on top, they had just as good a results with that as trying to drag something in the ground or trying to get it in the ground, or um, they said that, that they see no difference. I'll, I'll put a plug in too. If you're uh, if you're trying to convince a, a row cropper, uh, we did see a benefit of grazing because we're actually in, improving that nutrient cycling more quickly because we've actually ran, uh, it through ran it through the ruminant. So uh, that's the way you convince some of your your row cropping friends that uh, if they're going to have a cover crop, might as well graze it. There's some benefits there. They could charge them to graze it. <laughs> we wish. Oops. I guess I would say there's a lot of herbicides that can be an issue um, and also that with these residual with these <laughs> with these herbicides that are um, that are uh, residual herbicides it also depends on how much rain you get for instance some years you may get enough rain going through enough biological activity that uh, one year that uh, herbicide would be a problem and another year it wouldn't uh, however the thing I'll tell you is use the label. It's actually a legal document. Uh, if you don't go based off of the label, you're breaking the law. So that's the easiest way. That's why I'll say uh, look at what they have. Uh, atrazine, for instance, is a problem. And atrazine is used on, and in my neck of the woods, 90% of our corn. So those who are now looking at cover crops have to change their herbicide system to be able to then utilize it for forage. Um, some people are doing that. I mean. The easy, one of the easy ways that there are some individuals who are using more Roundup. Now, remember, we can get have problems with that, but they're they're actually rotating what fields they're using every year, so that they can uh, try to reduce uh, having uh, herbicide resistant weeds, but still allow them to utilize the cover crops for forage. Yeah, my question would be if if you were going to follow. 
rye grass, uh, winter rye, after you take it off, harvest it in, uh, say, early June or whatever, and followed with a Sudan, a sorghum Sudan cross, drill it in, what would you recommend for a seeding rate? And wouldn't you also have the same effect there that you would need to add nitrogen, it would seem? It depends. <laughs> Yeah, hybrid sedan grass or uh, uh, sorghum sedan grass cross would would uh, really work well in that kind of a scenario. Um, yeah, you would want to increase your nitrogen. I have my own personal uh, rules. I wouldn't want to put more than 50 pounds of actual in per cutting because I don't want to have too high of a nitrogen going into that plant. So minimize it, you might put split applications or, or something like that, but yes, you would want to. For, for a dwarf sorghum sedan, actually 20 to 25 pounds. Uh, if you look at a standard BMR type, we might be up to that 25 to 30. And if you're looking at a sedan grass, about 35. Okay, any more questions from the back? I guess if not, uh, let's uh, thank these panelists. And